So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Alison Smale. I'm Under Secretary General for Global Communications and Head of the Department of Public Information. And I'll be moderating today's press briefing. Just so you know in advance, we will wrap up sharp at 12.45 because the Secretary General will ma be making statement at 1 o'clock. As you are aware, the annual Africa Week at the UN General Assembly debate is currently underway. It brings together national leaders, policy makers, experts and others to celebrate the continent's achievements and to explore the biggest challenges ahead on the road to prosperity, equality and inclusion. This year's Africa Week fo focuses on Africa's development in the context of the Agenda 2063. That agenda represents an ambitious plan for an integrated and prosperous continent. To tell us more about this vision, we have with us today Mr. Kwesi Kwarti, Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Mr. Ibrahim Asan Mayaki, Chief Executive Officer of NEPAD, and Mr. Eddie Maloka, Chief Executive Officer for the African Peer Review Mechanism, Mr. David Mehti Hamam, the UN Secretary General's Acting Special Advisor on Africa, will then give a brief summary. So, Mr. Kwesi Kwarti, please. How much time do I have? You have three to five minutes. Three to five minutes. Seems like... Can we just stand or I sit here? Yeah, we can. We're setting our stopwatches. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you can sit. This will be a... You've got a... Good afternoon, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellencies, three minutes. What I'll do is that um, I'll read you a letter for one, because I like to focus on history. And uh, this is a letter dated 31st January 1687. It is from the Dutch factor on the coast of West Africa to his bosses in Rotterdam. Now, I believe the lecture, the letter captures the essence of what Winston Churchill said that uh, if you want to, the further back you look in history, the further forward you are likely to see. So with your permission, even if that letter takes me three minutes, I think that should be enough. The letter reads, on the 26th December, the Portuguese ship Handela arrived, which I have dispatched to deal with 525 pieces of slaves, 306 men and 139 women. As before, there's a great abundance of slaves here, but there's also great farming. With the result that I've not been able to supply this ship with as much millet as I'd have desired. The Negroes, who, as I have mentioned earlier, are here not at all polite. One of them has torn up the noble company's flag on the day the ship Cromantin left. On many occasions, it is custom, and one is even obliged to have such a flag on the beach for the reputation of the noble company as the Dutch West Indian Slave Trading Company. This event is therefore a serious matter, and the English and the French were quite happy about it, as they concluded, as can be understood, that our presence in this country is no longer brooked. I have therefore, on my own cost, prosecuted and eradicated the flag of Valeta on behalf of His Excellency the General and sent him to Ermina Perkenu. The General has publicly sentenced him to death and decapitated him and has sent the severed head on board the company ship Good Tiger Hither. As an example of the punishment for such wantonness, I have put it on top of a pole here at the lodge. This, in my view, captures the essence of the relations between Europe and Africa. And I think it is important for Africans to look at their history as a whole, because as uh, Hegel said, the truth is always the whole. On the basis of this history, we can begin to project the development of the relations with Africa and Europe the links to the United States, the development of the diaspora, the Caribbean, Jamaica, Trinidad, and the United States of America. This connection is the beginning of the globalization process. 
in this globalization process, the beginnings of international trade, Africans were the commodities. So that is the root of the history. I don't think I'll say much more than that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Ibrahim Asani Mayaki. Um, uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by uh, thanking OZA, the Office of Special Advisor for Africa, for organi organizing uh, the Africa Week with uh, such uh, energy and passion. Uh, rebounding on uh, what His Excellency, the Deputy Chairperson, was saying, um, uh, and looking at how Africa uh, tries to promote its development today by making sure that Africans are no longer commodities, uh, the African Union uh, and we as an implementing agency of the African Union, we focus on three critical issues. The first issue is whatever we do has to be linked to regional integration because we believe that regional uh, solutions are always better than national solutions, whether it is in development or in peace and security. And the African Union has organized itself in order uh, to get there. So regional integration, and regional integration is at the core of the Agenda 2063 of the uh, African Union. This agenda, 2063, uh, led uh, Africa to have a common position in order to enter the negotiation process of Agenda 2030. So this is why, by implementing Agenda 2063, we, at the same time, implement Agenda 2030. This is my second point. And the third point is that the greatest job, the greatest challenge uh, that African policymakers uh, are facing in the years to come will be to create these 400 million new jobs in the 30 years to come. And in order to create these jobs, we need industrialization. And industrialization will have to do fundamentally with human capital development. As uh, the Deputy, His Excellency, the Deputy Chairperson was referring to this morning in our one of our sessions, education, education, and education will be fundamental because development is, first of all, uh, knowledge accumulation more than capital accumulation. Capital accumulation follows knowledge accumulation. Thank you. Thank you. Both of you have made excellent quick points. Thank you. Now the floor is yours. And I hope we'll have Thank a chance you. to Thank hear you very from much, uh, Madam Moderator. And I also want to recognize the presence of our elder here, the Deputy Chairperson, and then the wise words that he he really um, put forward as a chapel to this uh, to this uh, discussion. And of course, my, my, my brother, uh, Dr. Mayaki, and then of, of course, uh, our host, uh, uh, Osa, uh, our brother, Mehdi, David Mehdi. And to say that I'm from the African peer review mechanism, where, where of course, the African peer review mechanism, it's a, it's a governance instrument and also a mechanism for the African Union. It was established uh, in 2003, and currently we have 36 member states, the latest to join. Uh, was, uh, was Namibia, and of course we are also happy that at the General Assembly now recently, uh, Gambia in indicated that they will be joining soon and we are looking forward to welcoming them. We send teams, they review countries, they look at the state of governance in countries, mm -hmm. they look at political governance, economic governance, socioeconomic development, and also they look at corporate governance, they, pro they compile reports, and in those reports then the countries themselves then develop what is called the plan of action on how they are going to address whatever challenges the country will pick up in the in the review process. And we work with a, a panel of eminent personalities that are appointed by our presidents. Then they are the ones who are deployed and they prepare these reports. So they, for this year, we have the report of Liberia, which we have just concluded, will be presented and we'll be deploying a mission at the end of this month to, to Uganda and Cote d'Ivoire, hopefully before the end of the year. And next year, we'll have a series of South Africa is coming up. Mozambique and a few other countries. So we do this report, but now recently in January, the African Union has given us additional responsibilities to track governance on the continent. So we're working on the tracking instruments for governance on the continent, but also to play a key role in the monitoring and monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of both Agenda 2063 and 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 the 
uh, 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 Agenda 2063 and of course the SDGs. So we, what is unique about the APRM is that it's an African led. So we tend on the continent our experience with governance it tends to be imposed from outside as a conditionality but in this case it's Africans themselves who have taken this initiative and have put forward this uh, established this organization and they review themselves we work very well with the UN in particular I want to single out the Economic Commission for Africa that is uh, being uh, uh, accompanying us uh, for, 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 for quite a long time both technically and also in the provision of resources for the work we do with our member states thank you very much the host, would you like to wrap this up? And then I hope there'll be some Thank questions. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And I just uh, want to build on the, or at least echo uh, the, what has been said by my previous uh, eminent uh, speakers and uh, uh, co-partners. I just wanted to give uh, some idea, or at least a context, of what Africa Week is all about. Uh, uh, Africa Week marks uh, this year actually the eighth anniversary, the eighth contemporary year for Africa Week at the UN headquarters in New York. In the less than a decade, about eight years, for about eight years, Africa Week has become an effective, very inclusive, and unique platform for policy dialogue to achieve and to speed up and scale up the implementation of Agenda 2063 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This year, based on the good collaboration and coordination between the African Union, the NEPAD agency, the APR, the Africa Peer Review Mechanism Secretariat, and the regional economic communities, as well as, on the other side, the uh, Office of Special Advisor on Africa, the Economic Commission for Africa, as well as the, the Department of Public Information, we came up with an agreed uh, theme for the year, which is supporting an integrated, <laughs> prosperous, people-centered, and peaceful Africa toward the implementation of Agenda 2063 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. While the week features a number of high-level events, they all emphasize on three important issues. The first one is that Africa is today ripped with opportunities with wealth of human capital, wealth of natural resources, with better and stronger and more effective institutions, and uh, significance and tape potentials. So the question is, how can we harsen our, how can we harsen African main resources in order to achieve the agendas that I just discussed earlier, and the goals and aspiration of Africa? The second one is that we have come up with the, uh, these two agenda, and we have now know that both of them are complementary and mutually reinforcing. So now, how can we ensure a coherent and integrated implementation of both of them, given that there, are, there is a synergy and complementarity between them? The third uh, highlight, or the third feature, uh, idea that came out of these various events during this week, is that there is a need to strengthen the partnerships, all kind of partnerships. The first partnership is between the African Union and the UN United Nations system at large. The second partnership is between African governments and the development partners, the traditional development partners, but also the new and emerging development partners. And the third partnership is between African countries, the private sector, civil society, academia, among others. It's not only important to have, to be fit for purpose from the United Nations and the African Union. It's also important that there is a unity of purpose to achieve the same goal. And it's only when there is a unity of purpose that we can achieve the Africa we want to ultimately achieve the world we want in order to leave no African behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so, questions, please raise your hand and identify yourself. Hello. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, thanks a lot for the briefing. I'm glad to, to get an opportunity to ask a question. I wanted to ask uh, um, something about sort of, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of economic growth and a lot of progress. One trend that's, that's emerged or that I've at least been reporting on is 
sometimes internet service is being cut off, which is obviously a big part of the economy, but there have been uh, in Cameroon for 94 days it was turned off, in Gambia before things were resolved, things were turned off. And I'm just wondering, can you speak to sort of the place of both the, inter the internet now in, in Africa's economy and steps maybe the African Union or any, any of the various bodies you're a part of might take to, to be sure that, that even when there's political tensions, um, that, that uh, this part of the economy can go. And maybe, maybe if you could give some update on the office, of, uh, on OSA itself, there's been, kind of, and I'm not saying you're, you're doing a great job, are you a candidate for the final job? It seems the post has been empty for, for, for some time. I've heard an Angolan minister. This is for the OSA office here at the UN since Mr. Ma since uh, uh, Magid Abdelaziz left. What's the status of the office? Just, I mean, you can use it as a campaign play <laughs> platform or, or just say what the timing will be. Thanks a lot. Well, as, as you can see from my title here, I'm still a director and acting, so as uh, further notice, I will still be the director and the acting special advisor on Africa. And to reassure you, I have not applied for the post. I'm happy with I am. I'm still involved with the daily functioning and the planning management of the work. So I'm still interested to, uh, to be at the technical level. Let me add very quickly and say that I've known David for many years. I've worked with him. And I don't think that uh, the title matters. What is important is the substance of what he delivers. He has pulled off a very, a very successful Africa week, and I think that's what we should be he should be recognised for. With his team, of course, of colleagues who are sitting, some of them here, acting, acting, or OIC or whatever. But what is important is that substantively, he's our brother, and he does very good work for Africa in the office of the special advisor, whatever the capacity, and we, will, we, we, we congratulate him for what he continues to do for, for the continent. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. If I may just uh, put in a word on this, uh, you know, in as much as we are working towards integration, we are working towards a coalition of uh, coalescing the various sovereignties, we still very much have to recognize that we are still living the reality of sovereign, independent African countries with uh, leaders who have to cope with uh, matters of security, their own security, and the national security. And in furtherance of that, sometimes we have to exercise powers that reduce the freedom, and uh, what the press can do. And among some of those might be cutting off internet services. However disagreeable this might be to us in our work, we still have to recognize that we are dealing with sovereign independent countries whose leaders sometimes have to act in ways that protect their own interests. Those interests, <coughs> in so far as the route to power have been derived from the people, may tend to align more closely with the people. But there are times when there may be divergences. And in, the, in those instances, it is quite understandable, not, though not necessarily the most favorite position that one wants to be, the reality obliges us to recognize that power does not exist in the vacuum, and you have to operate within those constraints. Those are some of the problems that we face, but the reality is that that is what the truth is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm so sorry. But uh, Africa is a region where the rate of expansion of Internet is the highest in the world. Thank you. Even may may I add something on that, if you don't ah, okay. I just want to say that mobile banking is more widespread and disseminated in Africa than even in OECD countries. Evelyn. Yes, sorry, I was negligent in not asking the first question. Uh, Evelyn Leopold, uh, and I welcome you on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Now, uh, my first question is to Mr. Mayaki. Uh, you mentioned yesterday that infrastructure was one of the biggest problems in Africa in shipping good 
gets to market and to just uh, having an enormous impact on the economy. Could you elaborate on that? And then I would love to know which countries you're all from. I can't. I used to be good at detecting accents when I lived in Africa, but I wasn't very good today. <laughs> South Africa, no? <laughs> I did see that. Who's going to take the first crack? Thank you. I have a German accent. <laughs> so I'm from Niger. Okay. Now, the, the um, three issues on infrastructure. The first one is it's important to note that uh, most of the infrastructure that we inherited from the colonial time, I, I don't want to go back to this issue, but it's important to note that, was extractive oriented. I mean, most of the infrastructure was not oriented towards uh, inclusiveness and development, but towards extraction. So uh, in the last 50 years, uh, the, the job that the governments have, uh, have had to do is uh, to, ma to make infrastructure more inclusive and reoriented towards development and less extractive, even though we still have quite uh, uh, a good number of extractive uh, uh, type of infrastructure. Point number two, 80 percent of the cost of infrastructure today in the continent is paid by uh, uh, public resources. Uh, and uh, point number three, we have a, a gap uh, of about $90 billion in terms of infrastructure financing. But this gap is covered $50 billion a year, a year on the continent by public sources. So we, we still have a deficit. And that deficit will be filled by public-private partnerships on uh, uh, projects that we are working on, uh, for which the internal, uh, 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 the, the, the internal rate of returns are, are good. Uh, Africa is perceived as risky, uh, but uh, we are working a lot on de-risking issues. And we do it uh, uh, in collaboration with Economic Commission for Africa, the African Development Bank. So that movement is an ongoing movement. But beyond infrastructure, the key issue is to uh, make sure that infrastructure is not just building a road, but infrastructure contributes to economic intensity. And this is why more and more we are thinking in terms of corridors and uh, North-South Corridor, Central Corridor, uh, Abidjan-Lagos Corridor. By boosting uh, economic density within these corridors, uh, infrastructure plays a very useful role in order to lead to more inclusiveness. How about within the country? OK. The, uh, uh, let me give two examples. Uh, we won't solve energy issues. Uh, globally without regional projects. Uh, this is why INGA is going to be finalized in the short term. And INGA will provide uh, uh, power to not only the Southern Africa region, but the Central Africa region. The more we have regional projects in infrastructure, the better it is for integration. Now, you will still have national projects. Uh, for example, in order to boost agricultural productivity, you will need uh, renewable energy in rural areas. But these are smaller projects, but where the governments need to, uh, uh, to be active and contribute, and together with the local and external private sector. Mm. Thank you. The gentleman there, and then the may, gentleman. May, may, may I add a word before? I'm so sorry. <laughs> may I? Of course you may. Um, Yes, but um, let me thank you for your rather interesting question. Um, at independence, most of the infrastructure development, like railways, led directly from the mine, the gold or diamond mine, to the port. That's it. So much for physical infrastructure. Education was the kind of education which was intended to make you subservient. We were taught to sing, in the bleak midwinter, frosty winds may moon, marching barefooted in the hot sun. Now, 
the new narrative, and this is evidenced by the German Compact for Africa, which is particularly interesting and commendable, trying to build infrastructure relevant to Africa, trying to link Africans to sources of funding. And uh, this is the kind of new thinking that is beginning to emerge, and we're very grateful for that. For our part, what we need is to implement good governance, rule of law, and to govern better, and in the words of Kofi Annan, to govern better together. You can guess I'm from Ghana. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, very yes, briefly. And then we have time for probably one and a half questions. I, I would like to add some more, def uh, adding to the words of wisdom of the deputy chairperson, that there is no country in the world that has ever developed without modern world-class infrastructure. And if you look back historically, the New Deal, when Roosevelt has adopted the New Deal, at the end of World War II, the Marshall Plan, even when Spain and Portugal and Greece has integrated the European Union, the main focus was infrastructure. In the US, it was infrastructure within between states. In Europe, it is to build infrastructure and rebuild regional integration that is taking place now. And for the newcomers to the European Union, it was the same thing. Now, the issue is in Africa, as Professor Mayaki was pointing out, is that 80% is coming from public financing. There is a challenge for Africa, is that successful and good stories do not come to the international media. If there is a good story, we leave it out. But if there is a bad story, it comes out virtually the next second. And that is an impediment and hindering private foreign direct investment in Africa. As Professor Mayaki was saying, the perception of risk is much higher than the real risk. The rate of returns of investment is the highest in the world, and the default rate is the lowest in the world. So you have, we have a paradox, and I count on you, international media, to showcase of the good story that came out today on education, on health, on infrastructure, on regional integration, on good governance, on the APRM, on NEPAD implementation, etc. So that negative perception, if it changes and it makes it, we will see that the rate of return, the perception, would be actually reduced. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gentleman yeah, with the microphone. Yeah, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press, and I'll, I'll make this very quick, because uh, you alluded several times to good governance, but we know the reality is that in quite a number of countries in Africa, there are substantial issues with governance, rule of law, corruption, rule of staying in power beyond the constitutional term, et cetera. So what specific steps will you be addressing and suggesting uh, across Africa, maybe with, under the auspices of the African Union, to improve governance. Thank you. We have, for instance, the peer review mechanism where governments judge and critique each other. And this is the chairman of that. And I'm sure he can tell you better than I can, Eddie. I think it's a... It, it, what you don't have at the moment is a, is a, it's a leader who wakes up and say, and overthrow another leader and say, I'm president. It's no longer allowed. So if you do that, it's unconstitutional change of government. You immediately are subjected to sanctions. You are isolated. You are not welcome to attend meetings of the African Union. But late 80s and probably even early 90s, it could still happen. So that has already now been uh, banished effectively. But also, you don't have leaders who wake up and say, I want to stay in power beyond my term. So at least those who are doing it, they do it constitutionally. And, 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 and legally, there's nothing wrong with that in that uh, uh, it's a constitution, a constitutional, constitutionalism requires you to govern according to a constitution. We do have cases in the world where leaders can stay in office as long as they're elected by their own people. In other countries, they have term limits. So now you have a trend in Africa whereby some leaders, when their term comes to an end, they've, done, they've completed their two mandates or three mandates, then they change the constitution through their constitutional processes to extend. So that's where now the, where the conversation should go. And we are beginning to, de to debate in Africa, 
is term limit uh, a solution to everything. Is w but what is important is that nobody does it by decree. Nobody changes it like in the past because then you get isolated. So what is good is that there is now a trend towards very strong constitutionalism on the continent. And, uh, and but constitutionalism goes with strong institution, active civil society, oversized structures, and all that. That's what the APRM we try to do, and that's what. And we have the instruments in place now. We have the charter. We have all this. So we are now working with our countries to ensure that they com there is compliance, there is domestication, there is reporting, and uh, that's what the peer review does. So if they don't see it as an external. Um, uh, pressure or something that is being imposed on them, but it's something that they themselves as leaders, they work on it. And I can tell you, I can assure you that we're making a lot of progress. I'm coming from Niger. Niger is in ECOWAS. Um, 13 years ago, President of Niger, Mauro Tanja, wanted to extend his constitutional term of two mandates. And he was suspended by ECOWAS. So ECOWAS has embedded in its rules the fact that extension of terms is not feasible. So we should also talk about the, the good stories. Hmm? And maybe a last word. I, I used to be in New York here as deputy permanent rep from 2001 to 2004. Now I had a friend who worked for the Wall Street Journal. And he used to call me, that was when there were problems in Liberia, and I used to give him background briefings for his articles. So one day, he went to Liberia, and he called me and said, look, I'm surprised. I went to Liberia, and even against the background of the Civil War, there's such vibrancy there that he was amazed. So I told him, listen, my brother, there's an investment meeting in Accra. You, could, you, you should just hop over and cover that as well. He sounds so surprised. He said, no, there's no civil war in Ghana. I'm not interested in going to Ghana. When, does the, when next there's a civil war, call me and I'll be there. <laughs> may, may um, I add? Yeah, it's, it's a choice I, between I you making echo. a statement and them asking a very brief question. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, the a question and uh, uh, complement what has been said on the political side. On the economic side, in the midst of the financial crisis, International institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, and UN entities have shown that African countries were much more, more resilient and economically manage better their economies than many OECD countries. As a matter of fact, no African country, to my knowledge, have defaulted and has a very high external debt and called for various international institutions to, be, to bail them out. Thank you. Okay, very quickly, your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, could you please describe, how could you describe African Week today? Is as a very important meaning where decisions are made for to make in order to make a change in Africa or kind of meeting where African leaders come and chat around African uh, issue? Also, yesterday I was hearing someone saying that African problem today is a lack of goodwill from African leader. What's your response to today? Um, could you identify yourself? I'm Herman Humbo from BBC Africa C2 TV. Thank you. No, the issue of political will I want to challenge because uh, before I joined APRM, I worked in the in the foreign ministry of my country, and I, I was actually over the years I see how things have changed in Africa. You today you see leaders competing on building roads. You know, Dr. Mayaki here is at the APRM. You see. And then if you don't recognize, countries can even get offended. There is a very strong political will, demonstration of political will on the continent. Leaders are competing. They want to improve. They want to. And you see even the atmosphere, it has changed at the African Union. You can't say 100 percent, but it is changing. So there is a lot of progress. So a lot of our leaders want to see change, and they want to see the continent changing. So that view that African leaders are sitting back on the beach or somewhere basking in the sun, and it's not longer there. Maybe there are exceptions. I can't, I can't think of one. But the large majority, if you go to regional economy community meetings, African Union, you see the spirit of discussion and the intensity with which leaders and Africans themselves, they deal with this issue. You can see that there is a very strong commitment. It's not like in the past where the continent was run by technocrats. And on the issue of Africa Week, what is the purpose? 
My brother is here. I will pose the same question to you. Do you celebrate your anniversary with your wife? You do. If you do, you renew vows, you renew commitments, you, you, you re-energize yourself. So it's an opportunity for, for Africa to meet with the UN, to re-energize the commitments and the partnership, but also to think about the new ideas. There's a General Assembly on, on Friday where there's a report. So it's a, it, it, it's a ritual, but it's also a practice that enables us to maintain the energy between in the partnership that did exist between the United Nations and Africa. And we are all here. I don't come here often, but I'm only here for this. And this is probably one of the reasons that this event is very important for us to talk about different aspects and what is happening in Africa on, on, on infrastructure, on different things. And so not that our colleagues in the PR, the PRs are not doing that. They are doing very good work for their member states. Thank you. Um, I'm really sorry, but I think I'm, I personally have to leave to do something. So uh, if you could come maybe to the podium and ask the question individually. Thank you all for attending and see you soon.